open up, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Paul is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the churches of Galatia. Not one church, not independent Bible Church of Galatia, but to the churches of Galatia, many of which he had very likely started himself on his first or even second missionary journeys. He's writing primarily to counter the false teachings of the Judaizers. Now, Judaizers is a, is a word that you don't find in Scripture, but it's, it's a word that we do find in, in other writings. Judaizers are those who make a, an attempt to add the works of the law to the grace of God. It's, hey, you, you need to, to be saved, you need to trust Jesus, and, and, and it doesn't matter what you fill in the blank with, after that, you're wrong. <laughs> you, to be saved, you need to trust Jesus Christ, and nothing. And they're, they're adding the works of Moses and the traditions of the, of the law, especially, we'll see, they add circumcision to salvation. In order to be saved, they would say, you have to... You need to trust Jesus, right, but you also need to be circumcised. You need to follow the laws of Moses. Now, Paul knows that adding works to salvation would rob the Galatians of the grace and the peace that should be theirs in Christ. That's why in verse 3, he says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. But before Paul begins his case against the Judaizers in earnest, he needs to first establish himself as an expert witness. I mentioned, if you watch courtroom shows or if you've ever been on a jury, when they bring in a witness, they'll bring in a witness who claims to be an expert. But before they're able to give testimony, they have to give their credentials. Why should you listen to this person? Well, because... Because they taught in, in university for a long time. They've written some papers in some reputable journals. And, and they, they've done this for years. That's why you should listen to them. They are an expert witness. And Paul is laying out why the Galatians should listen to him. Why should you hear what this man has to say? What does Paul know about legalism, self-righteousness, and work salvation? Quite a bit. You remember, Paul, the apostle, wasn't always Paul the apostle. He started out as Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, zealous after traditions of the fathers. He was a persecutor of the church and the disciples of Christ. He knows a thing or two about legalism. He knows a thing or two about, hey, when you add the works of man, the works of the law, to grace, grace ceases to exist. You cannot have both. Paul knows about that. He knows that there's only bondage and oppression in a salvation that's gained through works. If, if you are saved by doing good deeds, when do you know that you're saved? The answer is you don't. When did the scale tip? You don't know. There's no peace. There's no, no joy to be found in a graceless Religion in a graceless salvation. And you cannot have works and grace as a means of, of salvation. This evening, Paul is going to continue uh, on in this same vein of thought. But he's going to give us some insight that's actually not found in the book of Acts. About how he went from being Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. It's a very interesting thing. We see his education. Look at verse 13 of Galatians 1. Verse 13 says, For ye have heard of my conversation, or my lifestyle, in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Wasted it has a pretty final sound to it, doesn't it? He was, he was serious about this. He says, And I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation." being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Okay, and that's where we stopped last week. And I, would, I read that so that we have the context. 
Okay? Do you see where we're going? Look at verse 16, the whole verse. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You see, here's what was going on. The, the Judaizers were saying, Paul's not really an apostle. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. He's, he's kind of a, a second-hand apostle. He's, he's not really, he's not the full thing. He's, he's kind of a protege of Peter and John and that, that crowd. That's what the Judaizers are saying. They're saying Paul doesn't really know what he's talking about. And so Paul comes out right out of the gate and he says, I immediately, as soon as I was saved and knew that God had called me, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. Now, we know about his, his Jewish education. It was second to none. Acts chapter 22, verse 3 tells us that he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. You say, that doesn't mean much to me. Well, it doesn't mean much to anyone anymore. But in that day, it meant a lot. Gamaliel, being brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, who was a rabbi in the days of Paul, would be the equivalent of being able to say as a lawyer that you went to Harvard Law. Okay? He was a big deal. And Paul had all of the right credentials. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. But where was he educated in the doctrines of grace? We know where he was educated about the law, at the feet of Gamaliel, and by the Sanhedrin, and by the other Jewish elders. Where was he educated in the doctrines of grace? Well, he's quick to say he didn't get his initial training from men. That's what it means when he says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. So what, what does that mean? That he sent away for correspondence courses? What, what does it mean that he didn't confer with flesh and blood? If you'll note, if you read, and we'll, we'll be in Acts 9 a little bit tonight. If you want, you can put your finger there already. He didn't ask Ananias when he, remember, he was on his way to Damascus, and God knocked him off of his horse and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And that was when Saul was converted. But he was blinded, you remember, and he was led into the city. And Ananias, another believer, came and prayed for Saul, and he received his sight again. And, and Saul, at the time, would be Paul. He didn't say, Ananias, before you leave, here's what I need. I need you to sit down. I need you to teach me everything. He didn't do that. He didn't go. There was a church in Damascus. That's why he was on his way there to begin with. He didn't say to the church. He didn't go to the church and say, brothers, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm a believer now, and I need you to teach me. He didn't do that. He didn't confer with flesh and blood. It says, verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were, which were apostles before me. Again, Damascus is north. It's in Syria. Jerusalem is to the south, but, but to a Jew, it's always up to Jerusalem. He says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem. Well, who's, who's in Jerusalem? Peter. John, James, lots of people, okay? He says, I didn't, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. I didn't go up to Jerusalem. He didn't run to Peter and say, Peter, I need you to show me everything you know about Jesus. Did Peter know about Jesus? Yeah. Very well. James yeah. knows about Jesus. John, absolutely. But he didn't see Peter and John. Or any of the others who had walked with Christ during his three years of earthly ministry. So where did he go? Look at verse 17, the second part of the verse. He tells us, he says, but I went into Arabia <laughs> and returned unto Damascus. What's in Arabia? Desert. Sand. <laughs> Still. As a matter of fact, if you look here, we have a map. Uh, if you look here, this is the biblical, the the time of, of Paul. So you see right here the, the Mediterranean Sea, and that brings you into Israel, where you have Jerusalem. If you go north of Jerusalem, you come to Damascus, which is in Syria. Still there, by the way. And he turns, and he goes east into Arabia. We would call this, in modern day, we would call it Saudi Arabia. So he goes into Arabia, and there's not much in Arabia. There's sand. Underneath the sand, there's oil, but he wasn't going there for any of that. He's going out here to be alone. 
He's going out here, Arabia. He, verse 18 tells us that this time of preparation lasted for three years. Again, we don't read about this in Acts. But, but Saul of Tarsus trusts Christ. He's, and he doesn't immediately confer with flesh and blood. He doesn't make the trip from Damascus to Jerusalem. Rather, he goes out into Arabia for three years. Incidentally, how long did the other apostles spend with Christ in training? <clears throat> About three years, give or take. Remember Peter, James, and John, and all the rest were with Christ during the three years, three and a half years of his public ministry. And so Paul goes out into the desert. Again, this is only mentioned here. It's not found in Acts, Acts 9, which is, is where his, his uh, conversion is, is related to us. It's interesting because Paul's experience corresponds to Moses. If you think about it, Moses had a great upbringing. Paul had a great upbringing. Moses was 40 years in Egypt, and then he went out into the wilderness of Midian, and he kept sheep for 40 years. Paul had a great upbringing and then went out into the desert of Arabia for considerably shorter than 40 years. One man said, I don't know who, who is, is credited with it, said that Moses spent 40 years feeling like he had everything. 40 years in which God taught him he was nothing, and then 40 years finding out that God was everything he needed. And God did that with Paul as well. If you would have asked Paul when he was Saul of Tarsus, hey, are you going to get into heaven? Are you going to be, are, are you and God okay? Do you have peace with God? He'd say, absolutely. Because I'm a Jew, because I'm, I'm a Pharisee, because I keep the law, I'm good with the traditions. But God used uh, a meeting on the road to Damascus to help Paul realize that he wasn't all that. Paul had grown up in exclusive circles, but he was humble that day on the road to Damascus. And when Paul trusted Christ, rather than going to man, even good men, Peter, James, John, Rather than go to men, he went into the desert of Arabia to learn at the hand of God the truth that he'd so long sought to destroy. Now we're left with a lot of questions unanswered because what you see right here in, in, in verse, verse 17 and verse 18, that's the only place we read about this. It's not found in Acts, as I mentioned. So what we know about this period of time is, is found right here. When Paul had met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was left blind. Paul stayed in Damascus until Ananias came and prayed for him and he received back his sight. From Damascus, Paul went into the desert of Arabia where he was taught by God himself. And our text, verse 17, indicates that he came back to Damascus periodically during that time of teaching in the wilderness. So he goes out into the wilderness and he spends time with God, where he's being taught by God the truths, the doctrines of Scripture. Not by man, he's taught by God. And he, he apparently would periodically come out of the desert and back into Damascus. You say, where do you get that? Well, his preaching began to make enemies. If you were to look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 32, we read, in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. Paul writing this, and he says, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. So here's what goes on. If you've got your Bible, turn to Acts 9 while I catch you up on where we are. He goes out into the desert, and God's giving him all this truth. Does God intend for you to just hold truth in? No. No, he intends for you to, to freely ye have received, freely give. So Paul goes out into the desert, and God fills him with truth. And Paul can't contain himself, so he goes into Damascus, and he starts preaching. And people who are comfortable with lies don't like people who tell truth. And so Paul makes enemies. If you look in Acts chapter 9, verse 19, we read, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Paul certain days with the disciples, which were in Damascus. So, in that verse, three years fits. 
because of what we have here in Galatians. In that verse right there, there's, there's three years that fits in there. It says, verse 20, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Synagogues. Who goes to synagogues? Jews. Jews. What did Jews think about Jesus? Not much. Not much. They don't think that he's the Messiah. But here comes Paul, fresh out of the desert, with seminary with God, and he comes in full of truth, and he's saying, Jesus is the Messiah, the, the Son of God in the synagogues. And they don't like it. They don't like it. And so a, a conspiracy is hatched against him, verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? <laughs> they knew why he was coming. This is, this is Saul of Tarsus. I thought he hated Christians. Well, he, he had. Verse 22. But Saul increased more and more in strength. Do you think that's talking about bodybuilding? No. No. No, it's talking about strength. He's, he's growing spiritually. Why? Well, because God is teaching him. And so he comes, he, he grew in strength and confounded the Jews which dwell at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Christ, again, the Messiah. Verse 23, and after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. This would not be the last time that Jews would try to kill Paul. But their laying awake was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. So that's how his seminary ends. He leaves seminary, not with a cap and gown and a diploma. He leaves over the wall in a basket because the Jews were out to kill him because he was preaching <coughs> salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And the Jews didn't like that, just as they had hated Christ when he preached that. Verse 18, back here in Galatians. Keep your finger there in Acts if you'd like. Verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. So it's not that Saul went up and he went to Damascus, got saved and came back. Three years, again, that he's in the desert, being taught of God, preaching in the city of Damascus, making enemies, and then leaving over the, over the wall. Paul had left Damascus under tense circumstances. Acts 9, 1, describes Paul leaving Jerusalem three years earlier. This is what it looked like when he left Jerusalem. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of, that, of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. That's the Saul that Jerusalem knows. Okay. That's how he left. And here he comes again. He's been gone for three years. He's a very, very changed man. But do they know that in Jerusalem? Not really. They might have heard rumors. But they don't know what's going on. They don't know everything. And so this... Saul of Tarsus, who had been breathing out threatenings against the church, is now coming back. He's coming, it tells us in verse 18, to see Peter. To see, it's the Greek word historio, and it means to visit for information, to gain knowledge, to become acquainted with. He and Peter hadn't been friends when he was in Jerusalem the first time. Far from it. Paul was the persecutor of the church. And so now he's coming back to get acquainted with Peter as a very changed man. And we read that uh, three year, again, three years earlier, Peter would have known Paul only as Saul, the persecutor. So there's going to be a little bit of fear there. Acts 9 describes what happened. In verse 26, it says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. Meaning he tried. He tried to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Why would they be afraid of him? Because of Acts chapter 8, verse 1. The last time he was here, he was breathing out threatenings against us. He was trying to take us to prison. 
And so, could you imagine? He comes in to a prayer meeting. Whew, you want to talk about icy stairs, right? Everybody's there, and they're, they're all the believers, and here comes Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, and everybody's scared out of their minds. Nobody wants, who wants to sit next to Saul at a prayer meeting? Well, not the Saul that they knew. He was the man who took them to jail. It says, he essayed himself to join to the disciples, but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them, how he had seen the Lord in the way, that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas means son of consolation. And it was only after the son of consolation vouched for Paul that he was able to come in and meet with Peter and the other disciples. How did Barnabas know? Well, I don't know. We don't have recorded for us. Maybe Barnabas had been up in Damascus. Maybe he had passed through. But Barnabas comes in and he tells, the, he tells Peter and the other disciples, he says, look, I've seen the change in this man. This isn't a trick. As a matter of fact, Barnabas probably told them, look, he had to leave Damascus in a basket over the wall because of his preaching of the truth. He's a changed man. And so because Barnabas was willing to put his arm around Paul and say, look, I know that he's one of us. This isn't a trick to get into our, into our secrets. This isn't some, some ploy. This is a changed man. You should see what he was preaching in Damascus. Barnabas speaks up. And Paul is allowed in. Our text specifies that he met Peter and James, the Lord's brother. Which means that this James was not one of the apostles. The James who were apostles, one of them was James, the son of Zebedee, John's brother, James and John, the son of Zebedee. The other James who was one of Christ's disciples was James, the son of Alphaeus. So this James, who he meets with there in Jerusalem, is not one of the twelve. Not one of the original twelve, and he wasn't the replacement either. He is, however... The Lord's brother is how he's described. Mm -hmm. This James was the half-brother of Jesus. We read about it in Matthew 13, 55, when a group of people in Nazareth said, Is not this the carpenter's son? They're talking about Jesus. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas? J Jesus had a family. We read about them here, and... Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, met up with James, the half-brother of Jesus. It says here in our text, but of the other of the apostles saw I none. This was not a meet and greet between Paul and all of the other apostles. Rather, this was a meeting between Paul and Peter to become acquainted as friends rather than as antagonists. They had not had a good relationship before. That was why Paul came up. Now, verse 20, change of face. He changes kind of his tone here. He says, now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Why would Paul make such a statement at this point in his epistle? Why would he feel the need to say, look, I'm not lying to you. I'm speaking the truth of God. Why does he feel the need to say that right here? Well, to be real honest with you, and maybe you've picked up on it, the things that he's saying sound kind of far-fetched, don't they? If you just get right down to it. He says, I got saved, and, and I learned I didn't confer with flesh and blood. I went out into Arabia. Oh, really? <laughs> Would be their mentality. What, what are you talking about, Paul? He, so he says... I, I, the things that I write unto you, I'm not lying. He was dramatically saved, radically transformed, and divinely trained, and uniquely qualified to speak with authority about the false teachings of the Judaizers. And in this verse, Paul is emphasizing that his teaching is directly from God. It's not from man. It's not even from Peter. They weren't together long enough to communicate everything. 
If you look back at verse 1 of chapter 1, you read, Paul, an apostle, what's the, what are the next three words? Not of men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Why is Paul making such a big deal that he wasn't trained by men? Because he was trained by God himself, which gives credence to what he's saying. Again, remember, he's establishing himself as an expert witness. Why should you listen to me? Because I didn't get this from man. I got this from God. That's why you should listen. So what happened next? He goes on. Again, kind of a narrative part that we miss in the epistles. They're usually very doctrine heavy, and Galatians is. But he's giving a story. He says in verse 21, afterwards, so this is after Jerusalem, Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he leaves Jerusalem, his brief meeting with Peter, and Paul heads back north. He's going back towards, well, back towards Damascus, which is in Syria. But he doesn't stop there. He just continues on. So if you see here on the map, he's down here in Jerusalem. He goes up through Damascus. He says, I was in Syria. What do you figure Paul did everywhere he went? Preach the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's going through Syria, and, and then he goes into Cilicia. Now, in Cilicia, if you'll see here, I know it's small on the screen, but right there, close to where you read Cilicia, you see the word Tarsus, which is significant to him. Why? Because he's, he's Saul of Tarsus. So he's going north. And he journeys, he kind of rounds the bend and heads out into what we would call Asia Minor. And he comes to his hometown, his home region of Cilicia, where you have Tarsus. Verse 22 says, And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So, he was in Jerusalem, which is in Judea. And he journeys north. And now he says, in verse 22, that nobody in Jerusalem knew what he looked like. Why would no one in Jerusalem know what he looked like? Well, how long was he in Jerusalem? Take, take a look in your Bibles. He was with Peter for how long? Fifteen days. He wasn't there very long. So a lot of people, his name, his, his face didn't have that notoriety perhaps. But wouldn't people have still known him from when he was there prior to his conversion? When he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against, against the church? Well, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we read, And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is talking about Stephen. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Saul had come in, like uh, like a fist. And when he came in, the church just scattered. Except the apostles, it scattered. So, so why didn't the people in Judea know what Saul looked like? And he was unknown by faith unto the churches at Jerusalem. Well, because most of the believers who had been there when he was starting the persecution had left. And so all they know about Saul in Judea, they know him by reputation. They know who he used to be. He's unknown by face, but stories would still be told in the church about Saul of Tarsus, the man who persecuted the church. But, but now they spoke of him differently, verse 23. But they had heard only. These are the people who didn't know what Saul looked like, but they knew the story. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. To persecute means to cause to run, to drive away, to press upon. That was what he was all about. Saul came in. He was fierce in his opposition of the church. Why? Why did, why did Saul of Tarsus hate Jesus so much? Well, because of his upbringing. Because he believed that Jesus was a false teacher. He believed that this gospel of grace goes against the truth. 
is what he believed, and that's why he hated it. And he sought with everything that he had to stamp out this new, this new sect of Christians. He was a persecutor, but then it says that he preacheth. That he which persecuteth us in time past now preacheth the faith. The word preach is the word evangelize. <laughs> to declare or to announce good tidings. So what happened is the persecutor became a preacher. Now Saul, we'll mention it a little bit later, he was a man with zeal. And he applied the same zeal that he had for wrong for right. He turned it around where he had been trying to stamp out the church. Now he was trying to spread the church, to spread the gospel. As a result of this dramatic transformation that had happened in Saul of Tarsus that turned him into Paul the Apostle, verse 24 says, And they glorified God in me. Glorified. It's the Greek word doxazo, from which we get the word doxology. It means to esteem glorious, to praise, to extol, to magnify, to celebrate. Paul says in this letter to the Galatians, I was fiercely anti-Christian, but God saved me. He changed me. He taught me, and he turned me loose with the gospel, and I've been preaching it. And because of the radical change that Jesus Christ made in me, the people who used to be scared of me... They glorify God because of me now. They see the transformed life. They see a fierce hater of Christ who's turned into one of the most dynamic evangelists and missionaries that the world has ever seen. And as a result of that, the believers who didn't know what he looked like knew him by reputation. And they said, God, thank you. Thank you for the change you've made in this man who once sought to destroy us. Saul was a trophy of God's amazing grace and of his long suffering. Reading verse 24, the question by way of application should be asked, is the change that God made in your life such that it moves others to praise God for what he's done? Are you, are you a different person because of Christ? Is the way that you behave, the way that you conduct yourself, the decisions you make, are you a different person because of Christ in such a noticeable way that the people who, who maybe they used to know you, they look at you now and they say, God sure did something with them. It should be. It should be that way. So a question for you. Why the autobiography? Why does, why does Paul take this time in the midst of an epistle? Why does he take this time and share with us about Arabia and Jerusalem and his travels back and forth and meeting Peter? Why does he do this? Again, because the false teachers in Galatia, the Judaizers, were spreading the word that, that Paul was not a, a real apostle. Let me explain what I mean by that again. They would say he was just a success story that the real apostles in Jerusalem had seized upon. And now he's going around, he's preaching kind of a second-hand gospel. This is why he's so quick in verse 1 to say that he's an apostle not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Maybe you've heard this phrase. Usually it's used in reference to a preacher and it, have you ever heard the phrase, their daddy called and mama sent? Have you ever heard that phrase? It's, the idea is it's all in the family. They don't really have the call of God on their life, but it's what their parents wanted them to do. And they kind of pushed them into the ministry, and here they are. Yep. Okay? And that's what the Judaizers thought of Paul. The Judaizers were telling everybody, this is just some guy who the apostles... Claim as a success story, and they kind of pushed him out here. He's not a real apostle. And so Paul takes this time to very deliberately defend his apostleship. Look, I'm where I am today, not by man, not because I was taught by Peter, James, or John, but because of Jesus and because I was taught by God himself. Paul was uniquely qualified.
Why is he an expert witness when it comes to defending against legalism and adding works? Well, he's uniquely qualified because of his past in Judaism and as a fierce opponent of the church. And he's also uniquely qualified because of his miraculous conversion and his divine training. God also uniquely uses our past, doesn't he? You think back and you look over your life and you say, there's been some rough patches in there. There were some times when I wasn't walking with God. Maybe so I, was, I was saved later in life. God uses our past to outfit us and to suit us to the ministry that he would have us to be involved in. You say, you don't know my past. To that, I would say very kindly, you don't know my God. God can use your past. You say, it's terrible. Well, God's good. And God can take your past and he can mold you and make you into the type of person who he can use in a unique place. Paul didn't know it. But when he was sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, drinking in Judaism, God was preparing him to go out and stand Judaism on its head. God was preparing him. God is always working within us to prepare us for the ministry that he's called us to be involved with. And I'm not talking about vocational ministry. I'm talking about personal, relational ministry. You have a past that uniquely enables you to talk to some people that I would find much more difficult than you would. Some of the struggles that you faced you, you know who can best comfort a cancer patient? A cancer patient. Somebody who God has allowed to go through that. I've seen, I've seen ladies who've gone through miscarriages and they've had, they've had trouble having children and they're able to come alongside of another woman who's just lost a child and they're able to say, look, I, I know how it is. Let me share with you what God did for me. Again, God uses your past. God used Paul was. Paul was an intellectual. He was smart, very smart. He was a zealot. He was a tenacious, goal-oriented man, and God used all of those traits. If Paul hadn't been intelligent, how would he have talked to the Greeks on Mars Hill? If Paul hadn't been zealous for the truth, how would he have kept going after they beat him with rods? He wouldn't have. But God took a man uniquely suited for the ministry to which he was called, and God turned him loose. And Paul went forward, depending on Christ in the strength of the Holy Spirit, and he took the gospel to the far reaches of the Roman Empire. God can use you and your unique gifts, your personality, your character traits to reach people for him if you'll allow him to do so. You say, I'm too stubborn. God can use stubborn people. Matter of fact, God can turn that stubborn streak that you've seen as a liability, he can turn it into an asset. I would venture to say that Paul probably had a stubborn streak. You know why? They stoned him to death right outside of Derby in Galatia. Do you remember what he did? He got up, and where did he go? Back into the city. That's not something that a pushover does. God used him. <clears throat> Is your life a trophy of God's grace? God can either make you a trophy of his grace, or he can make you a monument of his justice. I would rather be a trophy of God's grace. I'd rather turn my life over to God and say, Lord, you can, here, here I am, you can have me, warts and all. Lord, here I am, use my unique Past, my upbringing, the, the trials and tribulations that I've been through, Lord, they're all yours. Use me as you see fit. I'm thankful that we serve a long-suffering God who uses his word and his spirit to sanctify and mold us into the image of his son. Aren't you thankful that we serve a patient God? Amen. How, how long ago would he have set you down if he wasn't? He, he wouldn't have even picked me up. Too, too many problems with this one. But no, he's, he, he took me and he's been knocking off all the rough edges and all the parts of me that don't look like Jesus. He's 
sanctifying me, making me more like Jesus until one day I'll be in his presence. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. This transition in the life of Paul calls people who knew him and they knew of his reputation before to glorify God in him. People heard about Saul of Tarsus. They said, you mean the guy who kills Christians? They said, oh, oh, you haven't heard? He's a Christian. And everywhere he goes, he's sharing the gospel. He used to hate Christ. And now they beat him up because he won't stop talking about Christ. God took everything about him and used it for his glory. And God can do the same for us if we'll allow him to. Take heart in the fact that God can use your past. Be a trophy of God's grace. Allow God to use you. God has uniquely gifted you, and God has put people in your path that he hasn't put in mine. I should speak to the people who God puts in my path, and I should seek out, and you should do the same. God has uniquely placed us where he has. Nothing happens by accident. God put you where you are for a reason. He's allowed you to go through the things that you've gone through for a reason. Let him use it. Any, any questions about what we've looked at here this evening in Galatians before we wrap up in a word of prayer? Yes, sir. I wonder, going back to that, 15 days that he spent with Peter after he came back, if he didn't have information or God truths for Peter, since through the ministry, he didn't get a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know. Well, we read in the Old Testament, iron sharpeneth iron, so man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I would imagine we know, and we'll get to in Galatians, that Paul did help Peter. He would come alongside and help straighten him out. Because if you look ahead, if you read the book of Galatians, Peter gets out of line. Yeah. And Paul steps up and says, look, this is how God would have it to be. So abs absolutely, if they had that, kind of a neat thought. Any other thoughts? Yes, sir. What's the different meaning between Saul and Paul? How does the Saul became Saul and became Paul? So what just one letter difference there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> one letter difference in English. I'm not sure on, on in, in yeah. Hebrew. But yeah, so that might be one reason why they didn't text him either, because they had a different meaning. Maybe. Could be. Somewhat. Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure of the name meanings off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then let's go out and let's do what we've talked about here this evening. Let's look for people who we can talk to. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your word, for how it speaks to us. Lord, as we look at Paul, a man who you radically changed to, to make effective in the ministry to which you've called him. Lord, we know that you can and you want to do the same thing for us. I pray, Lord, that we would be effective. Lord, that we would allow you to use our past and our present to help folks to, to come to know you as their personal Savior and to be an encouragement to those who need it. I pray that you would, would use each and every one of us, Lord, who knows you as personal Savior. Lord, use us as you used the early church, Lord, to turn the world upside down for the cause of Christ. I pray that we would be, be seeking out opportunities and that we would embrace those opportunities as we find them as, as appointments from you. Lord, be with us now as we prepare to go our separate ways. Give us safety throughout the week. I pray that you would bring us back at the next appointed time. Lord, I pray that you'd be with the different ministries that we have ahead of us. I pray that you'd be with the missionaries as they travel to get here. Lord, be with uh, Bible school. Be with those kids who will be here and the parents who will be here. I pray that you would, would just even now prepare, prepare hearts Help them to be receptive to the gospel. And we'll give you all the praise for what you accomplish in us and through us and through this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed.